awesome, awesome hosts. I'm just testing. I wonder, can our guest hear me right now? Can I hear our guest? I'm just seeing if we can hear. Yeah, can you Natalie hear me? Tears. I can can't. Hear me? I cannot hear my guest oh. right now. So let me see if I can turn on. Can I hear the guest? Can you hear me now? Absolutely. Oh, great. I, I was in, uh, I think, limbo land. I was looking at you and I wasn't one of those technical things. I said, there's Candace. Oh, awesome. You guys, I would like to introduce you right now to our guest. We are so excited. She is a very accomplished uh, artist and we're going to be looking at some of her work and talking about her wonderful book that she has right here available on Amazon. I'd like to introduce everybody to Natalie Tears. Natalie, good morning. How are you? Thank you, Candice. It's a pleasure to be here. It's so nice to see you. Thank you for having me on. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Now, you know, you are such an accomplished artist. So why don't we just go back to the beginning? Tell us, how did you get interested in art? And uh, how did you get into the career that you're currently in? Well, that's that's going way back. That's going uh, way back uh, to when I was 13, 14. And I started at the High School of Art and Design. Um, I started my studies uh, in illustration there, and it was a wonderful school. It was a wonderful time. I was so lucky to get in. We had amazing teachers that were working in the industry in New York City, um, in the commercial arts, in theater. It was an extraordinary opportunity to be there in New York City with these people that were, you know, at the height of their career and through really altruistic uh, intentions, they wanted to usher in the next generation of artists. They weren't there really for the money. They were there because they were excited about young people who wanted to learn, who wanted to be the next generation of commercial artists. Um, so it, it's a wonderful memory. And I was very lucky after that, I continued my studies at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn for fine arts um, and the Beaux-Arts in Paris. But um, funny enough, even though I was studying illustration uh, as a young person, I did take, they had this wonderful program where you could leave school and work in the industry of your choice. And I chose theater and it was off Broadway. And interestingly, it sort of forebode the, it, it, I didn't realize it, but ultimately I went back to film and television as an artist but I wasn't, that wasn't all gelling for me as like a 16 year old, you know, I just love storytelling and I didn't, I don't know if I really understood what set designers and scenic artists did, but I found out and I got to learn and I got to do, and um, that was a huge learning curve for me and really a part of my love of storytelling, which sort of comes full circle decades later when I'm writing the book Fairy Tale Remnants and I'm pulling from all my experiences helping tell stories for others. So after Pratt Institute, after all that art education, eight years, I started to work as a scenic artist. And for those who might not be familiar, um, it that is the person that creates everything you're not aware of in a film. When you're watching a set and you think you see buildings outside or you think you see a sky outside, in those days before it was digital, it was a huge painting. And the people that do that work were scenic artists and that was me. They are also the people that create anything that helps visually the storytelling in terms of specialty finishing, portraits when you see a portrait hanging in the corner there's a scenic artist who put that together or if you think you see marble in a film there's a scenic artist who painted that so um i did that for years i worked for disney um as a scenic artist i i did big events like the rolling stones i was working in europe for about 10 years um i i was really lucky i mean i i worked on some fascinating projects oh, and i learned awesome. a lot yeah, I, I uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber for, you know, the, um, I'm blanking, Joseph and the Technicolor. Uh, Dreamcoat, uh huh. Thank you. Uh -huh. I worked on that European tour and um, all the sets for that. So it's it's been decades coming. It's, a, it's an amalgamation of everything I learned to help 
tell a visual story, even the things that we're not consciously aware of, the things that help the audience be pulled in to a new world, whether even commercials, you know, if it's a cookie commercial and there's a beautiful sunset out the window, it needs to tell a story about a frame of mind, whether it's sweetness or um, romance, there are people working behind the scenes to make sure that your experience brings you to a different place. And for that, I'm enormously grateful that I learned so much about color and storytelling and painting. And so um, I worked in film and television for many years. I, I worked on, you know, Martin Scorsese, Shutter, Shutter Island, uh, the, the film and um, other feature films. I worked for Tim Burton on um, Alice in Wonderland. And I was working in feature films. It was great. Um, learned a lot. And then my son was born. And things change, you know, you, you, you about where you can be and film is very demanding. You need to put in a lot of hours. So the way I worked and the way I started um, organizing my life in terms how I, I was going to move forward changed radically. And I started doing my own painting, the paintings about the stories that I needed to tell. And it, it evolved over years, but the book Fairy Tale Remnants is the accumulation of those stories and the, the images I wanted to share with the world. And I really think I'm coming from a place that I think when we're growing up, fairy tales help us so much to understand the world. They put into pictorial form the nebulous fears about the world, you know, things that are so hard to understand. We put them into pictorial form and somehow the mind can grasp it. And it's immensely relieving for children. But I realized as adults, there are things that are incomprehensible, you know, desires and fears and wonderful things too but i felt i wanted to put this into storybook form for adults so they are surreal fairy tales for grown-ups and and that's why i put it together and i'm still making these images i'm i'm going to do another book but this book is the first in i hope a long series of my images that share this sort of um dreamlike quality of grappling with the unknown and putting it, making things that are scary, beautiful. How interesting, how interesting. Now, when you work with these directors, uh, I was wondering, do you work hand in hand with their concept and bring it to fruition? Or do you flesh out your own concepts and give them to the director and say, like to Tim Burton, how about if we did this? Like, how do you guys work in conjunction with each other Two with such amazing creative minds? Excellent question. And it is, you know, every shade of gray in between it's um there there have been films uh, like interview with a, a vampire dante ferretti um beautiful set i did a lot of work on that and it was he does phenomenal drawings i mean he is an incredible designer who does beautiful renderings but very often you know there's so much to see to you might get an outline of what is expected for you. And then you know there are things that have to be addressed. Sometimes you come back and you say, you know, what about this? And that's where the wonderful exchange happens. You are, and that's why I'm so thrilled to have had, worked with these brilliant minds on film. Their concepts and their vision are so exceptional that it pushed me to do things in ways I would have never done otherwise. So when you're working at that caliber and you receive um, drawings from someone like Dante Ferretti or you know Tim Burton, it brings you to another level. And th that high makes you start you know firing like, okay, I get this, I see what he wants, but could we do this? What about if we use these colors? And that is sheer magic. So um, I think, yes, sometimes I work with I have worked with very tight specifications, but more often than not, there's a whole world in, in between where I gained a lot of design knowledge because 
for whatever reasons, and this happens in a production, things show up that were not anticipated. And you need to step up and say, okay, this has changed. What about this? What about this technique? What about these colors? And that's where I think everyone grows. Absolutely. Ricky says, good morning. Good morning, Ricky. How are you? Uh, Natalie also says, good morning. Good morning. Uh, please ask us any questions. She is here. We got her up early. We got her up early today so she could be here with us today. Uh, she is a very world uh, renowned artist and she's worked with the likes of like Tim Burton. And uh, speaking of Tim Burton, what was it like working? Because I, I saw a documentary recently on him and they considered him even out of the box at Disney when he worked yeah. at Disney. He was thinking outside of the box there and standing out so what was it like working with such a an, an amazing uh, basically like you said a, a genius director yeah I, I think for something like Alice in Wonderland is it's such a visually rich film the difference working with Tim Burton as a director who is essentially an artist he is an artist he understands the depth of visual layers um, possibly a little different from a normal director who might lean on their designer in a different way, who might lean on the director a little way, a different way. I remember for um, very uh, subtle details in Alice in Wonderland, there was a, uh, a, a house that was completely enveloped in the, the forest and there was mold growing on it. He was so uh, astute and on, in tune with detail, the type of mold, the coloring of the mold, there was a lot of um, attention paid to the finishing and the details in a, a very um, particular way. And it was really quite something because it's, as an artist, you re realize you do a deep dive into details that most people won't actually speak about. But as Tim was an artist, there were a lot of details about patinas on and this is all painted by people like me um, when you touch a doorknob the type of rust on the on the handle um, the type of wood age the type of oxidation on a on a surface why is a metal rotting that way why is it rusting that way do we give it more do we give it less it really the fine tuning visually was phenomenal phenomenal Wow. And Albert says, good morning. Good morning, Albert. Uh, Natalie says hello to you as well. And he sent you the um, a meme of the smiling uh, Amazon dog. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, <laughs> Tell us what, because I know um, you are also so active in, in color. Tell us the importance of color and how it evokes moods, different moods yeah. in uh, the projects such as Alice in Wonderland with Tim Burton that you've worked on. The, the psychology of color is a really uh, fascinating subject and it's one that I spend a lot of time on. Um, people, on a very profound level react to color in ways they're not aware of. It actually affects us um, physically. And I'll give you a, a very quick example. There is something called uh, drunk tank pink. And drunk when tank uh, the military, pink. yes, and I'll tell you what this is about. Um, when the military had uh, personnel that had drunk too much and this extended to it was something that caught on and they were, or whoever caught someone being drunk and they're getting rowdy and they can't be calmed down, they found that if they put them in a pink cell, they would calm down no matter who they were. Now they fine tuned that pink to find the pink that worked the most efficiently. And that became known as drunk tank pink. And then not only, you know, jails, military, different, um, correctional facilities that felt they were dealing with, you know, someone who's all amped up in particular on alcohol. If you throw them in a cell, this color, they calm down. And so they, they did a deep dive, like, why is this happening? They tried painting a room this pink and giving weightlifters the option of weightlifting in a white room where they could maybe bench 200. They put them in the drunk tank pink color. They could only lift like a portion of that. 
it affects us. It affects our brains in profound way, in physiological ways. So knowing exactly what impact colors have on an audience is really um, imperative in terms of trying to reach them and trying to communicate a mood. And obviously, in, in, we know that about packaging, we know that about um, all sorts of things that affect our lives, but it, it touches lighting, it touches you know, the colors we use for costume. So when I'm creating the images I, I am, which deal with dreamlike scenarios, they are like visual allegories for different things that happen in life, I'm very mindful of how I incorporate color into those stories because I want to connect in a very specific way. How interesting. Now, you were talking about uh, painting. What are the primary mediums that you work in? Is it, you know, paint, acrylic, what types of oil? Is it acrylic? Is it pastel? What type of mediums do you feel uh, you use most often? Well, that's interesting. And um, because I, I worked in film and theater, um, I was obliged to use all mediums because it really depended on the project. Whatever was appropriate for that particular scenario, that's what I needed to be adept in using. So now I have a toolbox. I mean, in my studio, it's everything. I work in oils. I work in acrylic. I work in pastel. I work in oil pastels. Um, I use a lot of tricks that are used in film to give the illusion of something when we need texture in film, sometimes to make something look like a road, a surface will be coated in crushed walnut shells, which is just a very cheap material that gives the appearance of asphaltum. But wow. in my paintings, all those things that I used um, in my life as a scenic come back into my work now when I need to do something, those are the techniques I pull on. How interesting. And they actually asked also in the in the chat, do you work in um, mediums like crayons? This yes, yes, absolutely. It, it, I have it all there. And uh, it really is about what is appropriate, not, um, it has nothing to do with tradition. It has to do with getting my message across and uh, the waxy, bright, vivid quality and the immediacy of crayon can be so great when you just need a punch, you're not mixing color, you see that red crayon and you go for it, that's what's required. So I have everything going in my studio. Oh, that's awesome. And Ricky just said, I'm looking at Natalie's art on the gallery page of her website. I really like this type of art, exclamation point. It reminds me of some of the art I liked as a kid. There was this book called, of course we love this, um, Where the Wild Things Are, that I would always <gasps> Maurice get. Maurice Sendak. Yes, Maurice Sendak, that I would always get in our class. We would go to the library. I loved the drawings in that book. Thank you so much, Ricky. Thank you. Um, and then Thank you. Uh, then, yes, that is so wonderful. And Albert says, where can we uh, get samples of her work? Actually, we're going to be taking a look at her book, which is called Fairy Tale Remnants. Thank you guys so much for asking. So uh, would you like to respond to um, Ricky when he was talking about Marie Sendak's wild, Where the Wild Things Are? Ricky, that also is, he is a phenomenal influence in my life. His imagery, um, his courage to face in the Where the Wild Things Are is an excellent example of facing fears. And um, he really delves headfirst into this journey of the little boy. I think his name was Max. I'm yeah, it was Max. It was. It was. That's it, right. And he gets sent to his room and he's having a hard time and he's being a bit of a stinker with his mom, but he's frustrated. And it's one of those moments we go through as kids, but as adults, you know, things are not going right for him. And he launches off into this fantasy world, which is the highest ideal for me. It, it iterates another challenge of taming the wild beasts, which ultimately comes back to him. It's his frustrations. They become the embodiment of this anger and um, frustration. And he goes to this place, wrestles with them. Um, he becomes the king. I mean, he doesn't physically wrestle with him, but he dominates them. And once he dominates them, or he conquers the self, because to me, that's the sort of existential question or development in the story. He goes back home. He goes back home and everything is right. But he has to go on that journey to get to that new place as a person, as a kid, as a human being. 
That's awesome. And we got another comment that said, uh, where the wild things are also a favorite. And there, Ricky said, mm -hmm. also, I like the art of Ed Big Daddy Roth, who worked in art that revolved around hot rod car enthusiasts. His art was also so colorful and wild. His fame, he was famous for a character called uh, the Rat Fink. Are you um, familiar <gasps> with that? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, very edgy. Love it. I love that work. And that's a, a, a lovely um, parallel to draw because, the, again, that imagery created such a specific mood and the rat fink was such a such a character, such a, you know, an edgy soul that those types of stories are the ones that you don't forget because because of the characters and because of the world that they create. Thank you. That's a great, great Oh, comment. awesome, Ricky. Thank you so much. We have another question. Are there any current artists that uh, influence you? Oh, yes, many. Uh, Gregory Hergart is, and this is funny, it coincides. I'm in a group show that's coming up and Gregory Hergart is one of the artists that I admire a great deal. And I had written to him and told him how much um, he is what we would call an urban surrealist. He paints um, scenes from everyday urban life, but he elevates them to a surreal level. Wonderful master of, of his skill. He's amazing. And I, I reached out to him. I said, I really admire your work. I think you're phenomenal, real inspiration. And wonderfully, magically, I will be included in a group show with him this May. And uh, they're, they're also doing a catalog. It's a great gallery called uh, Brassworks in Portland, Oregon. And gotta look his work up. I'm sure there, I know there are books on Amazon. Um, Gregory Hergart, he is um, an urban surrealist. Look him up, phenomenal work. Just his storytelling is off the charts. He's funny, he has a great sense of humor and a great sense of compassion for humanity. Oh, awesome. So um, he, he influences me a lot. Another huge influence is Robert Crumb. Oh, R. Crumb, um, Robert Crumb, absolutely. And um, I actually have the good fortune to be in contact. We've written to each other. He loves the book. He's been a great supporter. Um, he's been wonderful in his encouragement and his insight into the book and my work. I, he's been an influence on me since I was in my early 20s. Wow, we're actually looking at some of your work right now, you guys. I'm showing you some of Natalie Tierce's work. Also, we have another question. What do you think of the artist Banksy? As we take a look at your work. Yes, yeah, he's fascinating. I think um, he is, everything that he's doing really uh, challenges our perception of what is art, what is the society that we live in that embraces the art that we do. I never got a chance to see Dismal Land, um, this very strange uh, parallel universe um, theme park installation that he did in England. I would have loved to, but I am very aware of his pranks, his, um, his street art, I think we need him. I think um, we need to listen to him. I think um, some of the works he's installed in Palestine from the street art that he plants in the United States or anywhere, incredibly important. The pranks he's played at Sotheby's um, with his shredding his work when it presented in front of uh, the bidders is real. They are super important questions about how we value art. What is art? Who are we? Great question. Thank you so much. How interesting. We also have, as we're showing your work right now, um, explain because we have an ex a rosy exclamation point from the Jetsons. So can you explain, yes. because people are looking at it right now, uh, what exactly is this piece of art? This is a question about artificial intelligence and our society. Um, we are changing in a lot of the, a lot of artificial intelligence is wonderful and it makes our lives better on a daily basis but it is moving so fast i don't really think anyone understands how it's changing our culture the jetsons were in my childhood a view of the future 
And when we look to the future, we thought, oh, robots, it's going to be wonderful. Rosie's going to clean our house and she's a little bit of a wisecracker and she's a character and cleaning up and there was a warm, cuddly feeling. So I think we have that in common that whoever was watching the Jetsons has a memory of that. Now we're living in the time we are mm -hmm. with artificial intelligence and the questions are a little bit more complicated. Can artificial turn artificial intelligence turn around and sort of nip us in the butt? You know, like, you know, um, react with us in ways that we didn't expect or we didn't understand. And the idea that Rosie the robot is in a home and somehow she's got her hand on a rifle, you know, how did that happen? What? And again, that's sort of a, a very um, simplified metaphor, but an important one in fairy tale form. What is this power that AI has in our culture? What, what's happening? And how is it going to affect us? I don't think we really know yet. Right. That, those Great are very, question. very, very, very co compelling questions. And Ricky just sent Rat Fink Crazy Mouse Model Joint Removable piece, PVC Action Figure. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody else in the chat can see it. This is what you guys were talking about. Thank you so much, Ricky, for cutting and pasting it in there for us so we could see what uh, artist you were referring to. And then also, Natalie, tell us about um, this other painting that I'm showing everybody right now. It's a, a mom with uh, holding a, a child, another child is holding a blue balloon and another child is uh, standing on the floor. Explain this very compelling, interesting uh, painting. The first thing I, I noticed is the amazing amount of texture, uh, color yes. and texture that you have in it. Can you tell us a little bit about this painting? Well, I should mention that, uh, can you see me all right? The, the, the lighting just fell to bits. Oh yeah, so, no, um, no, I can see you look terrific. Great. Um, what I should mention and this is a strange aspect and one of the, the parts that really show how deeply these images come from my subconscious is that I don't start out with a sketch. I start out with a large canvas and I start throwing paint and pastel and grit and coffee and coffee grains at it. And I look within and see what's going on. What do I see? This painting started the same way with smudges and uh, splashes of paint. And what I saw, and I wouldn't have understood this before I was a mom, but it's one of those moments where the characters are in a birthday party and ostensibly we should be very happy. It's a celebration. But as a grown up, I have, and this will extend to people who are not moms or don't have kids, you're in a situation where socially you're expected to be joyous, but you don't want to be there. And as grown ups in kids' birthday parties, very often we don't want to be there. It's too much noise. It's too much everything. It's overload. I, I enjoy them as kids, but when you're sitting there waiting for your kids, you know you're grateful your kid is having fun. You're grateful everybody's happy and well-fed, but you don't want to be there. And as a mom, there's a certain amount of guilt. As a woman, there's a strange feeling that you should be happy. You should be gracious but as a soul you feel trapped you say this is not where i want to be there's some kid poking me with a balloon i don't know who he is there's another one screaming in the back one my kid is out passed out overdosed on sugar and has had it and i don't want to be here anymore and there's a lot of uh layers of guilt um sadness but the struggle comes from that we all have been to places where we should be having the time of our life and we should be grateful we have these opportunities. The conflict is it always doesn't line up. And that is the essence of the birthday party. How interesting. Wow. And I do see that now in everybody's faces because uh, you said it's supposed to be a joyous event. And yet I see the underlying theme underneath it of, of, of the, the conflict of I'm supposed to be having fun, but maybe I'm not. Yeah. You know, I do, yeah. I do. Maybe I don't want to be here anymore. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, how much do you feel, because you were talking about that so much of your artwork is on a subconscious level, how much of it yeah. do you feel is dreamscape that comes to you in subconscious mm. times of dreaming uh, when you're not actively thinking what, should, quote unquote, what should I paint next? Um, I think all of it is subconscious. Um, 
I think that um, in order to access the imagery, honestly, uh, I have to put myself almost in a, a trance-like state. Mm. And uh, I don't mean that with drugs or anything. I mean like just staring at the canvas with a certain type of music playing in seclusion, quiet, focus. It is a meditation for me. It is a way of accessing that strange part of the consciousness that we can just see the edges of like a dream. But we need to grab it in order to capture it. So yes, these are things that probably flit in and out of my dreams, but to actually access them in the waking life, I really need to prepare myself mentally. I, that's why I have a, a specific ritual with my studio. I need to go in for certain segments of time and part of that is really just getting into the right mindset, preparing my uh, space, and then working for so many hours. And I, I need that ritual, and I do it every day. Wow. It's the only way. Every day, I need to, you know, I get into my work clothes, I go into my studio, I prepare the space, I decide which music is going to play, and I start working. And it's only through repetition that you can access that very... Uh, strange place. How interesting. Um, we have a question in the chat. Do you teach classes? I have taught in my life um, and I've loved it. And I've taught um, little ones uh, in New York all the way to grown ups. I'm presently not uh, teaching, but I think I might do so again. During lockdown, the studio that I have now is too small. It's my garage. And the reason that my whole life has changed like that is my son is still in school. So I need to be somewhat nearby. Oh, do a little homeschooling. Mm -hmm. Then I jump down into the studio. That way I don't lose time traveling. If I, after everything calms down <laughs> and Josh goes back to school and I have a bigger studio, it is something that I even remotely, I would love to do demonstrations because I love to share the process. Absolutely. Uh, tell us about this other piece that is also, it's so interesting. To me, it looks like possibly Adam and Eve with two skulls yes. in the background, and it is yes. also uh, on a wall. Please let us know. I'm showing everybody. Tell us about this really evocative piece. Well, it's interesting. From in the Old Testament, Adam and Eve, I feel that even today, whether you know someone's Christian or not, the brunt that story and the blame that falls squarely on the shoulders of Eve sort of plays out in very subtle ways um, as a woman, I feel it, that it's her fault. And um, I think, although it's a beautiful story and as much of the Old Testament is, I think we have to really pay attention for the way we're living and some of these subliminal messages that really still come through in our culture about what it means to be a woman and what the responsibilities of being a woman is and, 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 and what, um, what responsibilities are placed on our shoulders that are maybe a little uh, misplaced. Maybe uh, they filter down into a message that is unfair or um, needs to be re-examined. Absolutely. Uh, that was one of the first things that I was thinking about when I saw that image as well. Uh, yeah. You guys, now, of course, we are talking to Natalie Tierson. We're talking about um, her book that is available currently here on Amazon. So we showed you some of these wonderful images uh, that she has of her artwork. And I know you guys have already asked in the chat about her book. So I want to show it to you right now. And I'm going to talk about the book and then I'm going to have Natalie explain it. What you're looking at right now is fairy tale remnants surreal fairy tales for grown-ups now uh, you can get this right here on amazon in kindle and you can also get it in paperback so explain this wonderful charming uh very mysterious book it again it's the accumulation of about two years work and um of course it is a, a longer narrative. And when I work every day to create these images, not all of them went into the book. I wanted to create not a storyline in the traditional sense, but to carry the viewer or reader through a story in terms of the highs and lows of emotions, desires, 
fears and treat it as though this is, as adults, our time to have a fairy tale, but a surreal one that we're equipped to handle. And quite frankly, you know, some of my best fans have been kids. And I, I describe it as a, a surreal fairy tale for grownups, which mm -hmm. is how it's marketed. But some parents love to give it to their kids. And I have gotten the most beautiful letters and, and responses. And in book readings, they, they just are so smart and so clued into their feelings and what is frightening and why it's frightening. They always have loads of wonderful questions. So, you know, I, I, uh, I've had a, a tremendous time with that type of feedback. It's been wonderful. Well, weren't some of the original, uh, like the Brothers Grimm uh, original fairy tales, mm -hmm. they had a much more uh, frightening, darker nature yeah. to them than what we typically see when, you know, companies like Disney have taken them over and have slightly uh, modified them. Right. Uh, most certainly, that's a, that's a great point, Candice. Um, and Maurice Sondak um, very famously spoke to this in, in saying that, you know, I could or we could as a society protect our kids from dealing with really frightening things, but we wouldn't be doing them any favors. Um, and I'm paraphrasing, but he felt that ultimately, as we know as grownups, there are things in life that are challenging and that take time to process. You know, the coronavirus, when that hit, what, what does this mean? What, 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 how is this going? It's, it was tough. I mean, we're here a year later, but these challenges as grownups, visually, that is something that's relegated to kids. Like, okay, let's present this in a way that you can digest. I think as grownups, we need it too. I'm, I'm talking about really simple um, one image. I mean, I love film and, and literature as well, but to experience that expression of a moment, we need that visual um, allegory to comprehend some of the more difficult emotions we have. And, and that's why I do it. Yeah, that's so true because what you what you said is so relevant, I think, because even with the current situation, I feel like we are still processing. And and still, we, we learn through hindsight uh, of looking back even a week, a month, three three months to the beginning of the year, to the end of the, uh, to the beginning of April last year, we're still starting to process uh, what, what has happened. Right. Right. And there are different aspects to that learning there. You know, there's the beginning where it's, you know, what is this? And these large questions are what I try and embody in my work in fairy tale remnants in the work that I'm doing now for the next book here. Now, um, I'm so grateful we're getting uh, um, inoculated. There's, you know, we can we can be protected, but it's a transition and I think there's even a difficulty in knowing what next. We've been in exactly. lockdown for so long that, um, and you see it with kids, like they've, they, my son has lived his last year alone, uh -huh. you know? There's this sort of like, wow, I gotta go back out in the world. What's that gonna be like? A little different for grownups, but is it, is it? I mean, we, you know, in a way we think, wow, I don't know if, if I was allowed to take the mask off, I might be afraid. I mean, I'm, I'm so used to going out that way. It's a habit, we'll get past it, but there's, um, there's a use to being in lockdown now that when we go back out, mm -hmm. we have to work those muscles. We have to say, okay, we're all right now. This is the way it is now. All those transitions are, I think, difficult. We're, we're capable of it human beings are immensely adaptable, mm -hmm. but it will take some getting used to. No, oh, absolutely. And we have another comment that says, your work is so rich. I can see why oh. Tim Burton works with you. Thank you so much. That oh, is awesome. Thank you. That is thank wonderful. You. Um, and you know, actually that brings up a good point because I did want to mention this. Your husband also yes. is a very, very accomplished artist with such rich work oh, yeah. in his own right. Tell us a little bit about him and what he does. Yeah, he, he is Chris Towell. Uh, he, you can find him on uh, Instagram. He has a, a website, um, livingimagestudio.com. Um, he is a very unusual combination of artist and engineer. Um, Interesting. He also, yes. I mean, originally his training was in engineering 
And very often you don't get someone who has a combination of the left and right hand brain to this degree. He's a genius, really. He is learned, very skilled in engineering, but his passion was to sculpt. So he found his way into the film industry. I mean, he's worked on He's worked with Stan Winston for the Jurassic Parks. He was, wow. you know, sculpting and working those animatronics. Um, he, every aspect of that creative process, he's capable and excels at. So um, the body of work he's working on now, I'm jumping around a bit, but he no, is no, such a, he is an amazing artist and the breadth of what he can do is phenomenal. He's working on these, um, he has a studio in North Hollywood and he's working on these steampunk machines where he reclaims parts of old machines, uh, brass, hardware from different types of mechanisms and he creates these incredible moving sculptures. Um, and he does every aspect of it. So he can sculpt mold paint if it's a custom piece of figure that goes in it or he can create all the mechanical parts to make something move. And I mean, I, and, and that's a whole other, that's how we met. We, we met um, when I left France working as a, an artist to England to work as an artist. We met at that time and then we started a business and that, but that's a long, long, long time ago. <laughs> We've been together many, many, many years. And so did he actually work on the um, dinosaurs for Jurassic Park? Oh yeah, oh yeah, Stan Winston's. Yes, he worked for Stan Winston for quite a long time when we came to the States. That was one of the first jobs, you know, he came with his portfolio. We moved to the United States from uh, London where we had our business and we worked in films there in 99. And uh, when he came to the States, uh, you know, he had his portfolio and they grabbed him. And he worked on those dinosaurs, the mechanisms, the sculpts, they have to be molded in casts. And that's, that's what he did. And then ultimately he went on to different projects, but he was at Stan Winston's uh, for a while. How neat. Uh, you know, yeah. I, have, I have a quote that uh, I want to read from one of my favorite artists of all time that I was following since college. Um, Robert Crumb actually yeah. uh, said uh, that you were a genuine visionary artist with direct access to my subconscious. So yes. I'm going to show if, if you guys are not uh, familiar with um, Robert Crumb, I want to show you uh, right here. This is Crumb's World. This is available on Amazon. It's hardcover. And um, Robert Crumb uh, talks about his uh, obsessions, politics, um, daily life. So tell us about one Robert Crumb, if people are not familiar with him, and who he is in the art community, and uh, your interactions with him. Right. He is a counterculture revolutionary. Um, going all the way back to the late 60s, 70s, um, he started out you know, before that. He never went to art school, interestingly enough. Oh, he I got, didn't know no. that. He, he uh, learned through the first job that he got, which was with a greeting card company, which is really fascinating given the type of work that is so edgy that he went on to do. That's really where he learned commercially how to render so that an audience can immediately understand where he's coming from in terms of his message. Um, he left that job and he, as a kid, he, he drew comic books. I mean, that's true, but that was sort of an informal play with his brother, brothers rather. And then um, he went on to start developing these counterculture magazines in San Francisco where he would sell them on street corners. You know, that's how he got his work seen at that time, 1969, uh, 1970. And then he started to get shows. He did an album cover for those in the audience that remember Janis Joplin. Absolutely. Um, yes. And, you know, he's he's been very selective about how he dives into culture. He was very, he's been invited to do everything that you can imagine, but very selective about what resonated with him and what he would and wouldn't do. And I have to hand it to him going his own route. He, he you know, he's a blue chip artist now and he, he starts from very humble beginnings, but he is a master in um, exploring the human psyche, every aspect of it, 
and he delves deep. It's not always flattering. He's not, he's not at all uh, flattering about himself, his thoughts, his desires. He's brutal, but he's honest. He's honest. And I think that's why he still resonates with artists today. There's so many other artists now that contemporary younger artists that cite him as an influence. I'm always like, oh my gosh, they mentioned, you know, Crumb. He is such a force. And he really uh, changed the way we present some of the more hidden or unspoken parts of the human psyche. And he's, he's done it very effectively. And that's why we, we cherish him. That's why, you know, uh, we think of him as we do. And again, him complimenting my work was one of the highlights of my life. I mean, to, to get that exchange with him, uh, that he liked the book and he it, it resonated with him and you know he had questions again about the technique and you know what is it that you're using to me it's uh, well i can die now <laughs> you know robert likes my work i'm good <laughs> it was all worth it <laughs> well yeah i remember uh, reading like harvey k Picar in college and what i was so <gasps> amazed at was oh. the yes the oh. um how everything that is hidden in the brain. He's almost like how a comedian says what society wants to say, but they're afraid to. I feel like he yes. was somebody that would lay everything out on the table to the point where when you first saw it, you're not flattering of himself. And, but no. it was just so transparent and flat on the table. At first, when you pick up those comic books, you're like, oh, you're like shocked, yeah. but then you're like, oh, yeah. but this is what people think. You know, this is honestly what people think when you take away society's visage that we have to always wear, you know? Um, we have a, qu a question, uh, because you've dealt with like Tim Burton and um, mm -hmm. like Jurassic Park, have you ever been to Monster Palooza, which is the convention for like uh, cinema makeup, special effects, um, this part of, uh, 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 of yes. um, the entertainment industry? I have. I've never presented personally, but yes, I have been. And it's it's fascinating. I love seeing the different iterations of how people express themselves in this genre. And it is um, anybody who can is interested in um, the science fiction to surreal, to horror, to monsters, to creatures. If you have uh, an interest, whether you want to pursue it or you're just fascinated with those genres, make your way to Monster Palooza because um, it's worth seeing um, the different people that show up and what they're working on. You can speak with a lot of artists. You can find out why they're doing what they're doing. Definitely, I mean, obviously it didn't happen this year in the same way. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, a lot of these conventions are the only time outside of social media where you get to meet the creators of these books of these um characters try and get to go absolutely wow and then uh, we have another comment uh that that's part of art that died when digital took over the artwork of the album covers i miss that mm -hmm. so many albums had such great artwork electric light yeah. orchestra elo oh amazing and the band yeah. kansas oh always had yeah. awesome yeah. artwork on their albums talk about how those um albums and the artwork influenced you because they most certainly influenced me too thank you so much for that comment yes great great comment mm -hmm. because great comment. Uh, obviously when I was going to art school, I would hold them up like paintings and study them. I mean, these were phenomenal works of art. And um, Robert Williams, there are um, not the act. Robert Williams is a, um, a surrealist who I think it was ACDC. There was an album cover he did. Anyway, a lot of these artists that did a few or one album covers propelled themselves into fame by gaining uh, recognition through that medium of the album cover. And um, it, it's a wonderful way to touch people that we don't really have anymore. I mean, I, I wish we did. And of course, when we're in the digital world, we do see um, visuals for the band. And yes, there is something, but holding an album cover, and again, this is why I did the book. I feel that holding the book in your hand in in private just having that moment with the artwork is so different from flipping through a screen i'm grateful for social media i'm grateful that i can connect globally with people that send me comments from all over the world 
but people ordered the book from all over the world. I mean, and so that means there are people in Germany and Japan, they're flipping through it and that's part of their lives. So I think for me in this digital age, that's a great comment about the album cover. The book is so important because there is a different relationship that happens when you're holding the image and you're there away from a screen. A screen, as wonderful it is, and I use social media, it's too fast. You're flicking through, there are too many distraction, distra um, distractions. When you're with a book or an album cover, there's a different thing that happens between you and the image. I, I absolutely agree, because I think there's that tangible aspect that you're talking yeah. about. Now, remember, if you guys remember in the chat, please let me know, when we were younger back in our day, you would put on the album, you'd put on an album for, for one thing, yeah. vinyl, and you'd sit on the yeah. floor of your room, yeah. Indian style, and you would literally yeah. hold the album and stare at the picture, because that's what we right. had before. We didn't have all the distractions of extra stuff. We would sit there and listen to the music, music and look at the picture and it would evoke all sorts of things in your mind. You had mentioned a music earlier and that's a part of your ritual, your daily routine in your studio. Uh, what type of music do you listen to and why do you think this music is so important in conjuring uh, these images that are in your book? Well, that's an excellent question. And, and you know, it brings me back to that. As you were talking about the album cover, I think there is a parallel with the um, meditative trance-like state I'm in and staring at that canvas and listening to music. Because more often than not, if I find a song, I love Tom Waits. Oh um, my gosh, yes, I, absolutely. Oh, he, he, you know, I will find a song by him and I will play it in a loop so that I hear it, but I don't hear it. And if it's working for me, I will let that run for, you know, eight hours, which sounds strange. But when I'm in that state and I found something that resonates with me and I'm working and it's working, I don't change a thing. So there are different artists that I enjoy listening to. Tom Waits immediately comes, but Again, if it's if it's a more um, soulful, slightly sad, I listen to a lot of jazz. I listen to Nina Simone. I listen to Billie Holiday. Um, I love jazz. I I love um, I love songs that tell a story. Even though it's more punk, I love the Arctic Monkeys because I find that their lyrics are beautiful stories, couched in punkish music, which you know is a really interesting um, combination because they're one of the bands that is able to talk or speak or sing about very sentimental things in love and relationships, very sweet things, but it's it's largely punk or rock and roll. And they it, it, that edge combined with that deep feeling resonates with me. So I will leave them on in a loop. Wow. And listen to it over and over again. And if it's working, I don't touch a thing. Because it's so, almost like vibrating at a different frequency. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've got a, a, a viewer is uh, looking at Heavy Metal Magazine right now as we're talking. Right. That is awesome. And there's so many visuals there. And then yes. uh, Ricky said, you're right. I'd spend hours looking at the album covers and reading the lyrics on the inside jacket. Absolutely. We would sit there, read it, look at the front. We'd look at the back and we'd sit there and read with the album with the songs. And, and again, absolutely. That's why I did the um, book because the interesting process is that I start with a canvas, which is terrifying in the same yes. way, you know, you, you look in, when I was a kid, I looked into the dark and I was sure I saw something. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I saw something. But, and now I put myself in that position where I'm looking at this dark, smudged, gritty canvas and there's nothing there, but I'm looking for something. And when I look, it starts to, and I think there's something to listening to that music and staring and searching that resonates when you talk about looking at the album cover and reading the lyrics. So the reason I put the book together is that after I find the image, I had something to say about these images. And so I thought, okay, I'll do the image and then some very short prose because I don't want to go on and on about it. I just want to give a few words, almost like a lyric from a song to give insight into where this piece is coming from. So another reason for doing the book is actually the writing to accompany 
the image without taking away from the image. I wanted like an album cover, listening to music. It very much has to do with the way I created it in the first place. That, so I, I just didn't understand that until just now. So you do not use a blank white canvas no. with just gesso on it. No. You are not looking at white. You are taking these no. coffee grounds and you are putting randomly dark colors and then almost divining images that are coming through subconsciously from what you're seeing. Uh, I, I, I thought it was a plain white, but now I understand what you're saying. Can you explain that to everybody? Yeah, yeah. Um, again, a plain white canvas is is terrifying to me. Um, and I had to work that way when I was working commercially. But you have a different framework. You're given a storyline, an objective. It needs to be seen for this. And it has a challenge and it's wonderful. However, I'm seeking within. I'm not telling someone else's story. I'm trying to find the monsters that flit through my mind. And I found that creating this chaos of dark marks and colors was the equivalent of staring into the darkness and finding those the edges of those monsters or people that I almost could see in the dark, but not quite. So when I start a canvas, no, it's never white. Sometimes I, it starts off on the floor and I'm throwing leftover coffee. I'm mixing up dirt or sand. When I go to Santa wow. Monica, I bring back some the sand, mix up some sand and some gesso, throw it on, mush it around with my hands. It is to see these pieces in real life, they're very uneven. They're very unpredictable. Um, they have a wild surface with all sorts of grit and marks. And then when that's dry, and I usually have a few on the go, I put it up and I stare at it. And I look and I look, and this is very time consuming and it's work and it's hard and it, you need to really let go, relax, and focus. Sometimes I turn it upside down. If nothing's happening, I might turn a canvas again, say, okay, try again, and look, and look, and look, and look. And I start working. And if I really hit a wall, I, if I hit a block, I put it to the wall, funny enough. I put a face it to the wall, and I pull another one out. So I have three going at the same time. And, and they all start out with that chaotic, uh, dance of random marks and that's how i dive in that is so interesting because i also feel like um philosophically i i feel like the world is born of chaos you know yes. and the world is born of of randomness and then it's you are creating these pieces of art from the same uh you know uh, uh, start from the same start um we have another question do you remember a magazine called omni absolutely uh, it started in 1978. I would buy it just for the artwork that was in it. Do you remember that? Omni Magazine. It was science. In 1978, I was reading Mad Magazine a lot, but Oh, Omni, yes, yeah, I, I love I'm it. Not, uh, Omni doesn't, and if I did, I'm blanking. I remember, um, Ricky, it was done by, actually, the publisher was Bob Guccione, of all people, but it was a science magazine. And uh, oh, I know, it's so wow. funny, but it was uh, all about science, right? Uh, please let us know if that was it, because I do remember, and it was uh, all the way through the 80s, and it was actually a well-published uh, magazine. So thank you for bringing that up as well. Um, now I'm going to show you one of your influences. How many of you guys remember, for some reason, that just popped in my, on my head, um, King Crimson, Lark's Tongue in Aspic. Uh, oh. That was a song that what I would put on a loop over yes. and over and over again when I was yes. in college. And it was an awesome, awesome uh, song. And the crescendo at the end was amazing. Uh, the last issue they said was 1997. I thought so. I thought it was around there. Let's look at I'm some. Have to look it up. Yeah, you guys have to take a look now. Um, let's look at, look at some of your influences because this one, when I saw it, oh my goodness, brings so many happy childhood memories back. And I want to show you, you guys, this is Where the Sidewalk Ends, Poems and Drawings by Shel Silverstein. You can get this on Kindle. You can get this here on Amazon at hardcover. It's also, ooh, at a, a pretty fancy price. They're available on paperback. Tell us about like Shel Silverstein, Lafcadio, yeah. please tell us about how he influenced your career. So this was again, a very magical opportunity. I was only 16 and uh, I was going to the High School of Art and Design and I was fortunate enough, they, they had a program that if you were keeping up with your grades to a certain standard, they would let you out into the world and work it, in an internship off Broadway. So off, off Broadway, sorry. <laughs> it was on uh, like 10th. 
it was on, it was on 10th, it, you know, it was, it was off, off Broadway. Um, and at the time, Shel Silverstein uh, wrote a play called The Crate. And I did all the props for this particular play. Oh, wow. It was a very dark play. And it centered around a crate. And every um, act, every scene had to do with what was in the crate. And um, the, the stories changed from it being a surprise birthday present for a little girl um, to, you know, it, it all, the crate changed slightly and there were a lot of props involved and that's what I was responsible for. But I mean, he was there and I obviously, uh, The Giving Tree was huge for me. Mm -hmm. Shel Silverstein's book, the children's book that I, is still obviously available on Amazon. Um, so his drawings, I wasn't at 16 aware of the songs that he had written. I was too young, but I was keenly aware of the drawings that he did. And I was super impressed to see that he had excelled in writing and drawing and creating these books. And now he was writing a play and he was directing, you know, me and the other technicians, like, this is the essence of it. This is what I want the audience to feel and at 16 he said okay now go build it and I'm like oh so I you know went into the workshop and and whatever add-on there was or any uh variation to the crate I had to figure out like how can we do this so that when the lights go down they take it away and change it and within quickly because this is live theater you needed to do something that was quick and effective and read immediately so a wonderful experience that probably informed my desire to tell stories later on. Wow. Oh, wow. Ricky said, uh, I read Mad Magazine too, and I still have a lot of Mad yes. Magazine paperback books. Who remembers Spy versus Spy? Do you remember oh. that in there? Oh. <gasps> Do you guys Ricky, yeah. remember that? And uh, he said, Omni's last issue was 1997. The digital kind of killed it too. Uh, I guess so. Um, I mean, there was nothing like looking at a magazine. That's why I think reading is so important because still, like you said, it locks you into that world where you're not distracted by everything else because you're yeah, looking straight. Yeah. You're, you're in that world of that one book going page by page by page. Um, and I agree. I, there's a lot of validity to that. Uh, this is a director that I'm going to show you guys that I also know strongly influenced your career. I am also a huge fan and was, uh, oh, they, uh, Ricky says Spy vs. Spy was my favorite. Oh, awesome. Um, this is a director that has strongly influenced me too. I love his work. I tried to see his exhibit. We were in uh, Guadalajara. It was actually uh, uh, sold out. We couldn't go, but um, what I'm showing you guys, uh, just because this is very popular now, on Amazon Prime, you can see Pan's Labyrinth. And oh, uh, this, you can yes. rent this in high definition. You can buy it yes. here on Amazon. And of course, this is Guillermo del, Tor del Toro. Tell us about his influence, his work. Um, yes. J just tell us about how he has influenced your career. Again, he is a master of storytelling, uh, visual storytelling. And... Um, Interestingly enough, he has an enormous art collection. They had an exhibit, uh, I think it was in Santa Monica a few years ago, of all the art that he personally owns. And he is so visually aware and so uh, in tune with the different ways of expressing visual allegories that every still of his movies are like a painting. They really are. and. I, I watched uh, Pan's Labyrinth again in lockdown and it, it made me, rem you know, his films are so rich, but they're the type of films that when you go back to, you say, ah, oh, look at how he did that. Oh, look at the lighting on that. I see how he's done. Oh, look at that. So it's, it's this weird dance between, that's why I could watch it probably right now again and enjoy it because I'm, I'm sort of torn between getting swept in and stepping back and saying, as an artist, like, how did he do that? How, look at the way he's captured our attention and then diverted it this way, or look at the device he's used to make us see this character in this light or how he's proportioned the screen compositionally so that this person is alienated, this one is in the foreground. All those devices as an artist are things that I, I want to just be lost in the movie because that's heaven and it's like a vacation. But yes. I'm also asking myself, 
How did he do that? Why is this working? This is amazing. So um, again, a great study into, I mean, it's a wonderful story, but an, he is a craftsman when it comes to conveying a mood visually. Well, you know, we have a, a comment in the chat, actually lots of activity in the chat. It says, Guillermo del Toro, exclamation point. Uh, Ricky <laughs> says, uh, and Mad Magazine. Oh, it actually went up. I missed it. I'm sorry. Can you cut and paste it again? I just missed it because it went up already. Uh, uh, was talking about Mad Magazine, and we'll see it in a moment. And then uh, another chat, I was going to bring him up, Guillermo del Toro. He had good Toro. He has an art background and creates an art log in every film. How interesting. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Uh, and then uh, Ricky said, I liked Cracked Magazine too. It was Mad's yes, rival. Yeah. I, I don't know about that one. Oh yeah. Oh, amazing. Amazing. And uh, again, the same sort of caricature, um, same sort of humor, sort of uh, social commentary. It, it was wonderful. On a par with Mad and yes, Arrival. rival. Um, Mad just seemed to have that edge. I mean, Mort Drucker, who I think just passed away at 99. I mean, the, the, they were working their whole lives. I mean, they, the founders just loved what they did and it showed. And yes, digital did kill mad. But as far as being artists, those guys were doing it because they couldn't help themselves. They, <laughs> were, they, they lived and breathed, you know, the pen and ink and the storytelling that that was what made them tick. And it, it you feel it. You feel it when you pick up an old issue. I think Robert Crumb is the exact same way. I think that that yes, was his yes. a catharsis was being able to get it on onto paper. Um, and then he said, and Mad had the little micro drawings that would be in the margins of the pages. In the margins. Yes. How funny, how funny. It's great, great chat this morning, you guys. And like I said, if you're just joining us, we're here with artist Natalie Tierce. And please uh, continue to engage us in the chat. Here's another project that um, you worked on. We had touched on just very, very early on earlier. But I want you to elaborate more because you have worked with this incredible director. This that I'm showing you guys is Alice in Wonderland. You can watch this here on Amazon. You can rent it in high definition and you can also get it here in high ID, so an HD. So um, tell us, what did you do here? What did you create to um, right. uh, just, you know, better put his vision out there? What were you responsible for? There were, and interestingly enough, even though we were in the time of digital, there were sets where the actress who played Alice was um, very big or very small, and those were actual scale miniatures. So oh, but wow. that was not digital. So when her hand went to something that was tiny or when, you know, she was in a room, there was an interior, I remember, um, and I can't remember the scene, the name of the scene, but she's in this wonderful interior with this elaborate ceiling that is peeling and that it's a, an abandoned structure. And she's at the point where she's very large. When she's in that environment, all that patina, the, the room itself, uh, the peeling, the decorative painting, all of that is hand painted by us. And wow. the, the real trick was that there were the miniatures and then the larger set when she was transitioning, transitioning. And we had to make sure that they jived from the small scale to the larger scale so that there wasn't a feeling of it jumping. And again, this is not copy and paste. These are, you know, this is mixing color and making sure that the, the rust, the patinas, the colors, the decorative painting all synced when you went from one to the other. How interesting. And we have a comment, a question in the chat for you. What do you think yeah. about Robert Williams, the hot rod artist? Who is that? I, phenomenal. Phenomenal. Again, I, he, he, um, I mentioned him, I, I said Robin, I think, but it's Robert Williams. I may have flubbed his name. Um, phenomenal artist, technically brilliant. The, he works on so many different levels, um, that in order to convey this idea of ephemeral being and almost a dreamlike state with the very physical presence of hot rods and people and sexy people and real people, he is able to do that all on the same canvas. And that is a dexterity that, you know, anyone would aspire to. He is phenomenal. And 
I, I admire him grateful, uh, gr uh, greatly. He is, he is really something else. It, they are, they need to be studied because there is such a wealth of um, surface texture. I mean, not in the physical sense, it's very subtle painting, but he has um, the ability to, in a way that Trump Loy does, convince you that you're seeing a transparent bubble at the same time you're seeing the glass on a, a hot rod car is slightly reflecting the image in front of it. He's amazing, amazing storyteller and very Californian LA with the romance of the hot rod car and the culture. He, he tells a story of that time perfectly. How interesting. It's funny that you mentioned that because I was just thinking um, how artists are sometimes uh, very, very reflective of where they are. For example, I think when you said California yes. culture, I thought of Peter Max, the bigger, yes. you know, bright canvases yes. that uh, he, he was doing at the time. And to me, it really sim symbolized uh, California, SoCal at that time. Yeah. And, and funny enough, Peter Max, the first job that I did uh, coming to California uh, the Yellow Submarine. Do you remember the visuals sure. for that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right. So the Beatles, the Yellow Submarine, Peter Max designed a lot of the look of those visuals. And it's a very psychedelic film. The first job that I had as a scenic artist when I came to the States was a theme park in Japan based on the Peter Max visuals that happen in the Yellow Submarine. And they were huge murals, like 20 feet long. And I had to find a way, we, we all did, there were a lot of artists working on the different parts of elaborating these vibrant ink drawings into large scale paintings. And technically it was very challenging, but it was a wonderful project because it made me study what he did very carefully. How interesting. Yeah. Lizzie, thank you so much for following. Thank you so much for following us here this morning. And if you're just joining in, we were talking to Natalie Tierce. She is an artist, a uh, well-known artist here uh, in the film and television industry. She's been telling us about her book that is available on Amazon, in addition to her career in the film and television industry. Let's look at another one too, because we haven't talked about this yet. So I want to show you guys what it is. And then I want to know, Natalie, what you did on this project. This is a, I love this movie, but it is dark, but I can see how painting would enrich visually what this movie is about emotionally. This is Shutter Island. Uh, yes. This is uh, directed by Martin Scorsese and it star stars Leonardo DiCaprio. And uh, you can rent this right here on Amazon Prime. Perfect thing to do this weekend, you guys. And you can also purchase it here. Uh, tell us, what did you do on this film? Well, Famously, I mean, it, it, again, what I loved about this film is that they used real scale models, and those are models painted by scenic artists. They're, it was not digitally created. So when DiCaprio is in that tower, we needed to recreate that for certain shots that needed miniatures. So all that brick looking up to the skylight of broken glass, that strange major structure that was sort of the pivotal um, set in the film. The bricks were tiny, tiny. I forget what scale, but when I remember <laughs> painting the interior, the bricks were created by the model makers and then the grout had to be dealt with. I believe I used some kind of syringe to mix up the colored grout and pour it in between the bricks. I mean, it was very time consuming, detailed work. It was a pleasure to be on, but in order for that set, when you saw the interior, for whatever reason they need to go and switch scale for the effects that they need, they were using proper miniatures. I mean, there's a famous um, scene with the lighthouse that was about, I think, um, I think it was about eight or 10 feet tall and they use that for different aerial shots, but it, you know, it what that's it. Eight or ten, a real lighthouse is, you know, I don't know, fifty feet tall. So everything that made that piece believable, whether it was the texture or the patina on it, that needed to be painted. Um, that's the type of work that. I was involved with and the, the level of detail for film is really quite extraordinary. So you, you really have to be present and aware of 
like I said, grout details, because when that camera doesn't lie and it's sweeping through, if something is painted or um, approximated with scenic devices that doesn't read, it, the audience doesn't know why, but it throws them. It doesn't feel right. So the best work as a scenic is the work that goes unnoticed. If you're doing your work well, it only helps to engage the viewer and send them to another place. They don't ever think for a moment that this is not a real lighthouse. Absolutely. We have or a this structure. Yeah, go ahead. We have a question, a great uh, chat today, you guys. Um, do you want your uh, work displayed on walls like in an American city? Is that, uh, can you elaborate what you mean by in an American city? Uh, do you want, do you, do you mean you want it displayed on a wall in an American city? We have another, uh, another uh, comment, another part of the seventies era that is gone for good, except in what pictures were saved was an amazing airbrushed art that was on the bodies of custom vans. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, of Which course. were called yeah. California vans. Yes. 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 From like in the in your... 70s and 80s. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, those, those artists were phenomenal. I think there are in the, in the genre of uh, pinstriping, there are still some phenomenal artists that are working in a slightly different direction, but are, have great skills decorating cars and motorcycles. The iteration is a little bit different, but the, when I was a kid, those pictures of the California vans and the huge murals they had on the sides blew me away. I would find them in magazines and just pour over them. I love them. I do too. And I remember in the 70s where they had like um, uh, versions of like sunsets or sunrises, yes. dolphins. I mean, yes. all this great uh, uh, woodland scapes. And they would quite yes. often be in uh, round shapes. They would be in a round shape on the side of the van. For some reason, it was circular. I don't know why. Uh, we have more elaboration, uh, elaboration now. Uh, they were asking, do you want your artwork displayed in any city in America, large size uh, on a, a very, si like on a wall of a building? Um, do you see your, do you, like Peter Max size, do you see your, your uh, work being that large? Um, it's interesting how sometimes people uh, the, explain how sometimes in our minds subconsciously, like Peter Max did large, large means better, bigger, more valuable to some people. You know what I mean? Isn't that weird? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a, a weird phenomenon. Great question. Um, I have, I mean, funny, it was just before uh, coronavirus hit, uh, there is a very talented photographer called Stephen Levy. And actually during the pandemic, he's been, he was doc, he was one of the only people allowed out with his camera to document the city asleep when there were no people out. But he did this project with um, a few artists and I was really grateful that I was included where there is this very elaborate machine that could blow up images three stories tall. And my paintings all around West Hollywood were projected onto two and three story buildings, which was, again, even though in my life I've worked large, I had never seen these paintings that big. And it was a phenomenal experience. And I think really something for people to be walking by and then all of a sudden they saw Rosie the robot, three stories tall. And I think that sort of unexpected experience when you turn the corner and all of a sudden you see in this case, uh, a projection, but it could be a mural, is something that really changes your mind and your day. And I love the idea. Well, so I, I, yeah, go ahead. Because uh, uh, he said some artists get a chance to tag buildings and their lives, their art lives are forever in, uh, for example, downtown Los Angeles in the arts district. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have many, many colleagues that specifically work that way. Um, and they actually create the imagery so that it will transfer quickly and well to a large scale building. It is most certainly something that I would love to see happen um, right now. I think it's because I spent a life on scaffolds <laughs> in the films and in buildings. I mean, all through much of my career, I was painting large scale even though it was for other people. Um, I think 
for this segment of my life, I, I've enjoyed the isolation of working in a studio, fairly large, but not like 20 by 20 feet. But again, it's something that I would probably want to look at again, because it's a wonderful way to share the work, like like the book. It's, I would be up for any way for more people to connect with my my paintings. Absolutely. And I want to share two more influences with everybody because I, I, I've also been so influenced by them. And I, I want you to talk about one, how they've influenced you and perhaps with this specific person in, in, uh, in, in what I'm going to show you, the whimsical nature of his work. This, what I'm showing everybody is Dolly. This is Dolly, yeah. the paintings. This is a hardcover illustrated book that you can get right here on Amazon. Um, Tell us how he influenced you and how, to me, he saw the world so differently with uh, yeah. like the, the, the uh, on very much on a subconscious level with like the melting clocks and uh, maybe that yeah. means, you know, the, the manipulation of time, our perception of yeah. time. Uh, so tell me how he really influenced what you do because I see a direct correlation definitely. Yeah, I, I think he was most important, especially in my younger years when I was understanding what painting can do and I was entering that world and understanding the full range of how visual images affect us and that someone like Dali you look at his work and you are you stop and you realize you have to reconsider all the familiar things he uses he makes sure that they have entered an otherworldly quality whether it's a melting clock or it's the way that he um, fragments the human body so that you understand it's a human being, but they're almost like a floating puzzle. Um, how we understand ourselves and how we exist in this world. Um, I think he was one of the first ones as a young artist that really got into me and made me understand the connection between psychology, perception, and art. I mean, Mad Magazine and, you know, that was about laughing and laughing at ourselves and laughing at society. But Dali made me think about who, how we see, how we see, what does it mean to perceive the world? What are we perceiving and how do our own minds play into that? So that, that was revelatory for me, I think, when I was 14, 15, 16, you know, just coming into the idea of how was I going to contribute to the world of painting? Wow. Uh, we, we want to show you one more too. Um, oh yes, definitely. We are going to talk about her book. I just want to show one more influence and then yes, we'll definitely go back and talk about um, Natalie's book. Uh, this is another person that influenced you, also influenced me. Um, I want to show you uh, this uh, documentary. This is Picasso, The Legacy. I encourage you, if you have time this weekend, to watch this. You can rent it right here on High Definition, and you can also purchase it right here on Amazon Prime. I remember seeing uh, the painting Guernica, and when I saw yeah. that, to me, it was a true depiction of the way the faces were of um, the, the atrocities of war. And um, definitely, uh, tell us about how he influenced your life. I remember seeing him on Sesame Street when I was a kid. Wow, did they get him on Sesame they Street? They had him on I Sesame Street, see... and he's, it was a painting, a horse on a piece of glass, freehand, and you could see it from the other side. Um, so I remember early, early memories of, of Picasso. So how did he, I, I see him as so counter-revolutionary to the art yeah. community at the time. Uh, tell me how you influenced by, by color, uh, his cho choice of color, shapes. Um, also, yeah. his uh, painting subjects, who he who he's yeah. painting people that were in his life at certain periods of his life. Right, right. I, I think that's an important part of knowing him as an artist, that the uh, women around him that were his muses, mm -hmm. um, that became integral to what he was painting, what he was depicting. I think he was there's so many things because he was painting till the end which is something that really inspires me that i hope that you know when i'm 90 or you know however far i get that i am still painting till the end he had a routine uh that was very specific i mean this is also this is outside of his work but it's the man in his work he had a very specific work routine where he woke up later in the morning um he had his breakfast 
he did some mailing stuff, worked. I mean, it was a very specific routine where he every day committed to, I believe, 10 or 12 hours of painting. He worked quite late into the night. And, you know, that was his routine. But it's very telling when people, I think, sometimes misunderstand what inspiration is or genius. I think you need to be consistent for those ideas to flourish and evolve. And he very much integrated what he was living into a new language that he created. But it's um, what's not always seen is the sheer dedication and hours to the last day he died of keeping that routine in the, the studio. And that's what allows uh, ideas and, and, and technique and all of it to, to flourish. So I, in that way, in particular, he's a huge, I mean, it's aside from his visual acumen and his talent, the way he lived his life w is quite stunning in, in its dedication and his output. I think there's something like 63,000 works altogether. I mean, the final archive of drawings, ceramics, lithographs is astounding. But I mean, he lived it into his 90s, but he was working all the time. That's the thing. He, so he was, it, there's a lot to be said for that. Actually, I think he, for some reason, it pops into my head. You guys check in. Did he die uh, April 8th, 1973? That's off the top of my head. Uh, so I think you might be right, but he was 91 yeah. or something. He was, he was in his 90s. Right. I think it was. Um, and then we got another comment. Tell us about her book, exclamation point. I want to buy it, <laughs> exclamation point. So we're going to do that, you guys. Um, and I've got another comment, such wonderful chat today. I'm telling you guys, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I get another chat. I never liked that type of artwork that Jackson Pollock did, but I liked the movie about him with Ed Harris. Thank you so much for putting this uh, movie in the chat for you guys. This is Pollock and it's starring Ed Harris. It has almost five stars and 830. 38 reviews right here on Amazon. This is another book. If you guys are interested in what we're talking about today, this is awesome stuff that you guys can do a binge watching session on Amazon, yes. Amazon Prime, and uh, watch these wonderful uh, movies and documentaries that we're talking about. And for you guys who are out there who are really interested in Natalie's book, if you have just joined us and people are asking to purchase right now. So let me show it for you. This is Fairy Tale Remnants, Surreal Fairy Tales for Grown Ups. And like I said, this is our guest today, Natalie Tears. Can you tell us once again about this book as I show it to everyone? Sure, sure. Uh, this was my deep dive. And again, this book is the accumulation of almost two years work. Um, I keep very regular studio hours and I have a particular process that I went into um, a little bit before. It's about exploring some of my own fears and apprehensions about this world as a grown up. And I feel that as grown ups, the essence of a fairy tale, which is to tell an, a story in one image or a few images, that type of visual allegory is so helpful in understanding some of the amorphous fears and struggles we have being grown ups in the modern world. And I think by embodying them, I can make something really scary beautiful. And that's what I want to do. Something that is difficult or scary, seeing it in pictorial form can make it more comprehensible and hopefully beautiful. Once you realize it's not just you, that this is something that we struggle with, whether it's loneliness, uh, desire, conflict, we all go through it. And these stories want to sort of share those experiences and make people feel like, wow, I've dreamt this, I've seen this, I've, and that's some of the most beautiful feedback I've gotten from around the world. I've gotten like a mom from England writing to me saying, birthday party, I know exactly what that's like, and I've never seen anything like it that made me think someone understood in this way. And to me, that's profoundly touching, you know, that people are connecting with the book and the short prose that I write with it, which is, as I explained, they're reverse engineered. I start out in a, 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 a sea of chaos of blackish, darkish colored marks, and I look for the visual story. Then after I achieve it, after I get to it and I say, oh, these are the characters, this is what's happening, the written word comes after. 
And I wanted to combine them in a book so that that experience could be personal to someone in a private way, because the reality is that seeing my images through a screen is different. Not everyone, I mean, I show, I show in a lot in LA. Um, not everyone's gonna get to a gallery. I mean, I would be great, but the reality is I would like more people to have this moment with my thoughts and my vision and touch, connect through their lives and, and see what they see. So the feedback has been one of the things that is sort of spurring me on to do more and do a second book because it's a, a very special feeling to think that you've connected to someone you've never met who's living on a different continent, but somehow understands what you're talking about. No, absolutely. Um, yes, Picasso died on that date. Thank you so much for, for finding that for us. Another question. Are you a fan of comic book art like Alex Ross or Jack Kirby? Uh, Jack Kirby. I'm going to have to look them up. Alex Ross, because, you know, I am a fan. Alex Ross, I'm writing it down now. Jack Kirby. I am a, a fan of the graphic novel, and I read graphic novels all the time i have uh, like my library is just packed i you know in thinking of what my influences are i part it way way down because there are just so many um wonderful stories that are told and that i just finished reading again uh persepolis um by the iranian author and um uh artist uh set i can't remember her last uh oh her name is eluding me but available on amazon i had a copy and i don't know where it went i bought it again oh marjan uh Sat yes. Sat Sat thank Sat yes mm -hmm. um a very wonderful story that she tells about living in iran during the revolution as a young girl what she saw what she understood how her life changed all with the benefit of these very simple, beautiful drawings about living her life there with her family, how life changed. She left for Europe. These, again, I, I don't see how you can read them and not be changed by them. They are her life becoming, living a, a comfortable life in Iran, becoming an immigrant, being seen as an immigrant, where she never imagined herself uh, being an outsider, but living in Europe, she was, and then she went back and she felt an outsider in her own country because of the cultural revolution and it fascinating stuff. So I'm going to look up these two artists and if I'm blanking on them, I'm, I'm sorry, but I am constantly buying graphic novels, comic books. Um, there's so many out there that are I haven't explored. So thank you again. Uh, we have an elaboration, actually. He said Jack Kirby created just about the whole Marvel universe with Stan Lee. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, the king oh, considered, Stan Lee. Oh, yeah, okay. considered the king of modern comic books. I see. OK, so I, of course, I'm familiar with Stan Lee, but now that makes sense to me. Right. So, so thank I, in you. one way or another, yes, I am aware of him. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much. And Natalie, now, if people want to follow your career, uh, yes. look at your artwork, see what's going on with you, can you please let us know, like, do you have a website, social media, yes. all that kind of good stuff? Yes. So, yes, I have a website. Uh, it is my name, which is Natalie spelt with an H. I don't know if there's going to be a link or something. NatalieTierce.com. So that is N-A-T-H-A-L-I-E. Tierce, and that's T is in Tom, I E R C E dot com. That's my webpage. And I usually, in my blog, talk about upcoming shows or other events that are going to happen. I have an Instagram uh, page that I update regularly, and that is also Natalie Tierce. Um, let's see what else. I am on Facebook. There is a Natalie Tierce Fairy Tale Remnants page where I post work from work in progress as well so like i'm constantly working on pieces even if i just show a segment um i show segments because sometimes they change sometimes as i'm working on it the finished product is very different from what you'll be watching characters their faces will uh develop into something else it's happening all the time so i post that on social media um yeah please follow i love it i love your comments keep them coming 
Absolutely. You know, you've got to get Natalie's book, Fairy Tale Remnants, available here on Amazon. And we have another comment. Uh, Jack Kirby never gets enough recognition. There is a book you have to get of Jack's and they suggest for you to go. I don't know if you've heard of it. Golden Apple here in Los Angeles. Is that Golden Apple comic book in Los Angeles? Uh, they were suggesting if you want to get a book by Jack Kirby. Um, and okay. uh Oh, and then thank you so much. Uh, hope to see you. They hope to see you at Comic Con one year. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's worth doing. I would love that. And then very thank you so much, Ricky. He put in your website, which is natalietears.com, for everybody to see. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, they say yes. The Golden Apple Comics is here in Los Angeles on Melrose. I just want to thank everybody today for just the wonderful chat that we've had today. Thank you so much for interacting with such engaging questions and comments that you've had for Natalie here. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your work with us. You know, we had, for those of you who are in the chat, we also had so many wonderful art items that Natalie recommends that are available on Amazon that she was going to share with you. So you'll just have to come back on. We didn't even get to that yet. So we have, you have all sorts of mediums, uh, 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 things that you recommend for people that are yes. artists. Yeah. Uh, that are learning and would perhaps like to do a career like yours. So um, perhaps we'll talk more next time about your career project uh, products that you recommend on Amazon. We just had had no time. So I want to tell you guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Natalie, for being here. You guys stick with me. And uh, didn't we have an awesome, awesome, awesome time with Natalie? Yes. We had thank such so a much. wonderful time. Um, what a tremendous uh, artist and I was so excited and like I said I encourage you guys to check out her book it is available here I know that some of you guys in the chat uh, were interested in purchasing it it is called fairy tale remnants surreal fairy tales for grown-ups uh, this is in Kindle version and you can also see it on paperback now um, this is great and like she was saying that it is uh, for uh, primarily adults but people are giving it to their children as well and um, yeah. take a look look she has all these very surreal narrative illustrations uh, and she has some writing that goes along with these pages with this book so uh, and a lot of it like you said is just pulled out of her subconscious we talked to her about how she creates her work I showed you a lot of her pieces um, some that are uh, were projected like Rosie the robot was projected on a building uh, in in Hollywood so you guys yeah. you know just an amazing artist her husband is also in an incredible incredible artist so you know hopefully yes. if we are look, lucky let's cross our fingers our eyes and our toes so we can get him on too he is a, a well-known sculptor here in los angeles oh, yeah. and he's also done work with um jurassic park with steven spielberg he was uh responsible for creating a lot of those dinosaurs it makes me want to watch the movie you guys it really does <laughs> i want to see that oh thank you so much for that in the chat I see, I really enjoyed this interview, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, and seeing her work, exclamation point. Thank you, thank you so much. That thank really, you. that makes my day. Uh, we love to bring you really interesting guests that are so uh, active in what they do, so passionate about the, what they do, so informative for everybody. And you know, you guys got some really great uh, comments today, because I remember yeah. the time of those 70s classic vans for those of of you guys who are old enough like me on ancient as the hills to remember uh yeah. how much that influenced uh us as kids and uh, mad magazine yeah. spy versus spy thank you so much for bringing these wonderful wonderful memories back to us uh so oh. yes that i really appreciate hearing that and you know we'll have her back on because you know we actually you guys just so you know we had a whole nother segment that we were going to do too, talking about all these uh, great items that you can purchase on Amazon yeah. uh, for art. If you're interested in art, painting, il illustrations, um, just all this great stuff. She was going to talk about more about her career and how she implements um, these. Yeah. Oh, and thank you. Another one, uh, a comment, uh, Heavy Metal Magazine too. Yes. That's right. We did talk about heavy metal magazine and how I love heavy metal. And I remember it. Who remembers Julie Strain on the cover of heavy metal? 
Um, she oh, actually oh, married yeah. the the didn't she marry the uh, the editor of Heavy Metal? And she created this oh, you know a great synergy between Martis, uh, model and artist, and uh, how they that. worked together to create those awesome covers of Heavy Metal <gasps> magazine. So we all remember oh. that. And just the the days of when you guys tell me about it. Oh, Kevin Eastman, thank you, thank you, Kevin Eastman. That's right. How many of you guys remember the days of when you actually held that album in your hand uh -huh. and you looked at it and you would stare at that album for hours and how it would just make you I think did. of more memories and more memories. And um, I remember so fondly uh, albums in the 70s with Led Zeppelin, uh, Pink Floyd, Pompeii. Remember Pompeii? Mm. Um, if you guys remember, oh, uh, oh, you said, uh, thank you so much, creator of the Ninja Turtles. I did not know that. And uh, you never got rid of your albums, LOL. So smart of you. That's great. And then Julie Pan, uh, thank you for reminding me. Yes, Julie Strain just passed. And Ricky, you still stare at your albums occasionally. I do too. And guess what? I heard that uh, vinyl is making a comeback. Is this true? Let you know yeah. that vinyl is doing as great as, well, CDs. Uh, so let us know. Another place, you guys, if you are in the Los Angeles area, I think it just reopened again, Amoeba Music. So if you guys yeah. are here in Los Angeles, uh, I encourage you to take the time to spend a Saturday or spend a Sunday afternoon and you can peruse through Amoeba because Amoeba, they have everything. And uh, what fun that used to be for the weekends. Do you guys remember when you were in school and you would go with a best friend or even by yourself and just look at all the albums that you could find mm -hmm. at record stores? Well, Amiga is really, Amoeba is really it. You guys, we had such a wonderful time today. I'd like to thank our guest again, Natalie Tears, for coming and bringing all her creations with us. I encourage you to take a look and to purchase Fairy Tale Remnants, Surreal Fairy Tales for Grown Ups that you can get right here on Amazon. It's available in two forms, Kindle. It's also available in paperback. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, let's sway, you guys. Let's sway. I want you guys to have an awesome, awesome day today. You guys follow Sway TV. Follow Sway right here. Ooh, it's this way, sorry. <laughs> Corey says, thank you, Sway TV. Shakira says, thank you, Sway. Yes, guys, it is so much fun. We love Sway TV. Talk to all your friends and your family. Let them know about Sway TV. Enjoy the rest of your day. You can have a Tambe party. Thank you, you, Sway TV. Amazon Live! Woo! great time with all of you. Shop attainment all the time. We in the house. We having fun. We doing the thing. We swaying. Let's sway. 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 Let's go. Let's sway. Stay tuned. Woo!